Welcome to the second multifamily masters Glendale Pasadena chapter. Second meetup. Thank you, Jake. Uh oh, passed it up. There we go. My name is Dexter Harris. I'm from South Central Los Angeles. Worked in the education field for 11 years with special needs children. I'm currently a passive investor on 456 units. The market I'm looking to invest in is Texas. Cities are Dallas, Arlington, Houston, and San Antonio. Thank you very much, Dexter. Yep. Um, my name is Jason Malabute, and an easy way for you guys to remember that is uh, first you get the moolah, then you get the booty, all right? So, so uh, um, 2015, I started my career as a CPA. From there, I transitioned to real estate investing. In 2019, I was investing in single family homes out in Indianapolis, Indiana. From there, I have exited out of all those properties, never lost a dollar in real estate. Now I'm focusing on um, multi-family, focusing in the Indianapolis and also the Kansas City market. So, very quick heads up, you guys. Please mark your calendars. Wednesday, June 29th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. This is a big date for us because this is going to be our first live meetup. It's going to be at the famous bar out in Glendale, California. So please write down the address. We're going to have my lawyer, Josh Driscoll, as a special guest. He is going to be going over the importance of corporate structure when it comes to real estate investing. So this is a great way for you guys to learn more about the business and also network with other real estate professionals. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> Tonight, our special guest is Charles Seaman. Our subject will be underwriting and case study. Charles is currently a senior acquisition and asset manager of Investor Boardroom. He's responsible for performing all of the company initial underwriting and analysis of their deals. He has over five year experience. They have acquired 646 units, eight properties with a total value of over $47 million. They're, they currently have a 137 unit property under contract for over $16 million. Without no further ado, I'll introduce y'all to Charles Seaman. Hey guys, thanks for the warm welcome and for the introduction. Uh, let me share the screen so we can start up here. Okay, can everybody see the presentation? Yes, Charles, you're good. Fantastic. So as Jason alluded to, we're gonna be talking about underwriting tonight. So we're gonna go over some of the underwriting basics and also some recent changes that we've been seeing in the market. So if anybody's been paying attention recently, there's been a lot of a lot of changes happening, you know, and 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 it's good to be aware because you really have to stay up to date with this information so that way you can have underwriting that reflects that. So this here is our overview, our table of contents for tonight's program, and we'll start running through it. So for anybody brand new, you might be asking yourself, well, what's underwriting? So in simple terms, underwriting is the analysis of the property's income and expenses to assess the financial viability of the deal. What you're doing is you're taking the numbers that the seller has for how they're currently operating the property. You're probably applying some degree of pro forma and you're going to see whether or not the deal meets the return metrics that you're looking to achieve. So that 
That's the purpose of underwriting is basically determining whether or not the deal works. So this introduction to underwriting. So a few things to start off with. So the first thing you need to do, you know, with anything in life, you're going to have tools that you need. So when you're underwriting, your tool is going to be a spreadsheet or a program that's going to help you get the result you're looking for. So for me personally, I use Michael Block's Syndicated Deal Analyzer. Uh, there's many different tools out there. You can make your own. You don't have to use one that's on the market, but find something that does what you need it to do. It can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. There are some that are very simplistic and some that have you know, thousands of bells and whistles. It just depends on what you're looking for and how sophisticated you want to get with it. The second thing is you need information to put into the underwriting tool. So the information you need is going to be a rent roll and a T12. So if you're brand new, a T12 is a trailing 12. Basically, it's the same thing as a profit and loss statement. The only thing is it breaks it down by month. So when you see T, that stands for trailing. 12 means 12 months. So that's going to be the last 12 months of income and expenses, and it's going to be broken down on a month-to-month -month basis. So some people may look at it and say, well, what's the difference with the T12 or a P&L? And the difference is simply that it allows you to see trends in the numbers. When you have all the numbers consolidated and you have a 12 month total, you're still going to get the same end result, but the difference is the trends and the story that those numbers tell you. Because numbers aren't going to give you the full picture, but they'll certainly give you a good part of the story. So it's important to at least get these things so you can start your underwriting. The next thing is taking your, your financials and you're going to enter them into your underwriting tool. So the way it's usually done is if you have a T12 or any set of trailing financials, you're going to look at the income on a T3 annualized basis and the expenses on a T12 basis. The reason that this is done that way is because that's typically how lenders are going to look at it. Whenever you do your underwriting, you want it to closely resemble what the lender is going to come up with because you don't want any unexpected surprises. One of the worst things you could have happen is getting awarded a deal, thinking you have a great deal, and having the lender look at it from a total different perspective and say, well, this deal doesn't look that good to us. Because that may lead to a nasty surprise. You may wind up getting much less in loan proceeds than you expected. And because of that, what started out as a seemingly good deal may not be a good deal anymore. Okay, so on our next slide, we're going to talk about some, some things that we do here after you finish your initial underwriting. So what is the purpose of the initial underwriting? So in my opinion, and my opinion might be a little different than some others you hear out there, the, the initial underwriting isn't really going to tell you whether or not the deal works. But that's ultimately the purpose of your underwriting. But what you have to do to make sure of that is confirm a lot of assumptions. Underwriting is built on assumptions. If your assumptions are wrong, your underwriting isn't worth much. So you need to go out there and put some legwork in and you'll need to start confirming the information that goes into those assumptions. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to get back to the broker. So for me, I look at deals that are usually 50 units and up and most times 100 units and up. Uh, so all the deals that I do are through brokers. If you're looking at smaller multifamily, then you may be going direct to seller so you can kind of modify this as needed to fit your particular situation. But for me, it's, it's brokers. So the first thing I'm going to do is when I look at a deal, I'm going to figure out what information do I still need to figure out to see if this deal works? And I'll make a list of those questions. And now the key here is only making a list of the questions that are going to make or break the deal. So when you're first starting out, you, you may not know that, but try and use some sense to it. If it's something that's a, a $25 item, it's probably not going to have a, a big impact on your deal. But if it's something that's a $45,000 item, well, that can swing the NOI of the property enough where all of a sudden your purchase price may be dramatically affected. So that's something you want to inquire about and find out. So I, I always say there's free questions and there's paid questions. The free ones are the ones that are going to make or break your deal. So what are the big impacts on the income and expenses? And those are the things that you want to question and make sure you really understand. So recently I looked at a deal that had 25% physical vacancy on the T12 when I looked at it on a T3 annualized basis and 15% economic vacancy for a total of 40%. So, you know, I, I have a running joke because one of the things I did when I first started 
was one night I sent the broker about 40 questions after I looked at the deal. Let me let me be clear, never do that. You know, there's a lot of things that can wait till due diligence. In a retrospect, I probably should have let a lot of those wait to due diligence, uh, which you know I've gotten a little smarter since then. So this same broker, you know, he 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 said, you know, I know you like to be thorough, let's try and keep it to a minimum. So I, I kept it to a minimum. I gave him one question. I said, you know what? This deal here is ultimately going to come down to the vacancy. You know, I'm familiar with the area because we have another property we're buying in that same area. And I said, well, why is vacancy so high here? Well, what's been the issue? And, you know, after digging into a little bit, it sounds like it's been management, but it's really been management because they've been hampered by ownership. So the ownership hasn't wanted to spend any money. Uh, they've been very reluctant to, to give the management the go ahead to do what they need to do to make the property work. So if that's true, then I feel good about going in there and being able to correct that issue. That's something I can solve. What I can't solve is if I'm on the worst block in a bad section of town. What I, you know, so, so you want to pick the low hanging fruit as people say, and that's going to be with anything in life. So what can you do to make something better? If it's a management issue, I'll take those deals all day long. Matter of fact, I love those deals. I would do those over a physical value at any day. So the second thing is your property manager. So you, you need to start building relationships with property management companies. You know, aside from brokers, property management companies are going to be the second most important member on the acquisition side of your business. And even though your management companies won't really come into play until you get the deal and you win it, the, the key is that you want to build a good enough relationship with them where you can use them as a resource to get information before that point. Now, if you have a deal that you look at and you realize there's nothing you're going to be able to do to make that deal work, don't stick it in front of them because you don't, you don't want to waste their time. You want to be respectful of that. But if there's something that you think you can come close on, put it in front of them and, and ask their opinion. What do you think of this? Can I push rents any further? Can I do better on the expenses? Do you see any mistakes in my underwriting? Because ultimately, they're going to be the ones that have to manage the property afterward. So it's in their best interest to give you good advice. Because if you're giving them targets that they can't hit, then you're setting them and yourself up for failure right from the beginning. So always involve them because you want to see what their perspective is and what they think is realistic for the market. Okay, so the next thing is financing. So you want to have a mortgage broker or lender, hopefully both even. Uh, there's benefits to both. It, you know, from experience, I personally prefer using a mortgage broker at this point, even when I could go direct to lender, just because they have more leverage than I do. You know, they're doing more deals with lenders. It's going to mean more coming from them if they ask the lender the same thing that I do. You know, I might be just one loan or two loans a year to the to the lender, but if that mortgage broker is bringing them you know, 15 or 20 loans, their their business means more. So either way, whether it's mortgage broker or lender, get a financing quote, a quote, a term sheet. You know, so it's not going to be something that's definitive. Financing can change right up to the end. You know, we have a deal that we're going to be closing later this week. Uh, and many of you probably know that interest rates and market conditions as a whole have been changing a lot these last few months. When we first started looking at that deal and we submitted our financing application in February, our rate would have been 385 at that time. Well, now we're looking to start at four and a half and it'll probably be way higher than that by the end of the summer. So make sure that you get a term sheet, but also realize that right now we're in a very fluid market, which means that things are moving quick. So sometimes when you get a term sheet, Unfortunately, two weeks later, it may be irrelevant, but as a starting point, you know, realize that you need to cushion some things, you know, never underwrite so tight that you don't have any room for error. If you do that, you're going to put yourself in a bad spot. Okay, so the next thing is insurance. So similar to financing, insurance has been very volatile lately. Um, you know, an, an interesting story, you know, for, for us. The deal that we're closing later this week probably had the highest insurance premium on any deal I've ever seen. And, and our mortgage broker actually told us it was the highest that he's ever seen on any deal in his career. To the point where it cut the loan proceeds by a million and a half dollars. We had to be very creative to, to you know, work with the lender, you know, switch insurance brokers and a whole bunch of other things to try and get it to work. But the point is, make sure you get an insurance quote. 
Now, similar to financing, these are things that are going to be fluid. They're going to change right up until the end. So until you bind your policy, it's not going to be definite. That can still change. But what it gives you is a starting point. Keep in mind your underwriting isn't designed to be a one-time thing. You don't do it once and forget it. What you do is you do it, and then every time you get new information, you update it. So it's going to be a living, breathing document that's going to evolve over time. You know, with, with any given deal, you know, there's a good chance that I'm probably updating my underwriting 10 times between the time I first look at it and the time I close on something, because there's going to be new things that pop up along the way. So you need to be prepared to account for that. Number five, this is a huge one. So for anybody who hasn't done multifamily, do not underestimate number five. This is extremely important, okay? You, you must, not, not maybe, must reach out to the tax assessor in the county you're looking. And you need to understand how their reassessment process work, works. How are they going to calculate the value of the reassessment? What are they going to do it? Is the sale going to impact that? So, some states and counties are what you call point of sale, which means that they don't want to wait until their next scheduled reassessment to get the increased value from that sale. So they're going to take that money right away. So that's going to affect your underwriting because instead of it hitting in 2025 when the next scheduled revaluation is, maybe it's going to hit in 2023 because they're going to say, okay, well, now the property sold, it sold at a higher value. I want my money on that higher value two years sooner. So that impacts the year that is going to go in your underwriting and can ultimately impact your numbers. Now, for anybody brand new, let me just kind of paint this picture here. Many, many times I've seen tax bills double and triple. Sometimes I've even seen them quadruple. Okay, so if you're looking at a multi-million dollar apartment community and you have a tax bill that's $100,000, that bill might become $300,000. That could severely impact your numbers. Matter of fact, it can flat out kill your numbers. So make sure that you do that. You have to understand that. You know, for me personally, there's been many deals I've looked at where the increase in tax alone has killed the deal to the point where it just hasn't made me competitive on it. But it's better to know that in advance than to think that the tax bill is going to remain similar to where it is now and be very surprised afterward. And then the last thing is update the underwriting. So as we were saying, the underwriting is you know, an evolving document. So as you get that new information, plug it in, plug it in, see how your numbers look. And then after you follow up on these items, then you'll be able to determine, okay, this is a good deal or this one's not so good. But you need the right information and the right assumptions to get to that point. Okay, so a couple of changes that have happened recently. So the first one, which we touched on a little bit, Interest rates. So I'm sure as all of us know at this point, interest rates are on the rise. And right now they're they're certainly fluid and evolving, but a lot of rates are between five and six percent for most multifamily properties. You know, just three and a half months ago, I remember when the rates were in the threes. And you know, maybe in a way I missed those days, but those days are gone. So we can't use rates in the threes anymore. When you're underwriting deals, you want to make sure that you're using current rates that reflect where we are now. For me personally, I'm using 6% on most of my deals at this point. And some people have said, well, it's a little high for where things are currently. It's true. But we're probably only one or two Fed meetings away from being at six straight across the board. And there's, there's still a lot of rates in the fives, but as of about a week and a half ago, you know, one thing that, that's happened is lenders are starting to raise their spreads. So when you're looking at interest rates, there's two components to your rate. The first portion is the index. And most lenders are going to have an index they track. It's usually the 30-day SOFA rate, but different lenders use different indexes. And it's going to be the spread. So the spread is the lender's money. You know, uh, it's, you know, when, when rates were very low, their spreads were lower. You know, th th there were times where they were, you know, 275, 300, 325 basis points. Now you're probably looking at 450, 475, and probably soon 500 basis points. And lenders are doing that because there's more risk. You know, two Fridays ago, uh, for anybody who's familiar with this acronym, CL, CLO pricing came in wider than lenders expected. And that's something that they look at because that ultimately determines how, they, how easily they'll be able to securitize 
the loans that they do and sell them off into the secondary market. If they can't do that, a lot of them don't want to do it because they, they don't want to keep those loans on their balance sheet. They want to be able to get them off the books so that way they can keep doing new loans. Okay, so then next thing here is cap rates. So this one is still in the early stages because keep in mind, price is always going to lead cap rate. So cap rate happens once a sale is closed. It doesn't reflect something that's under contract. So the thing is, commercial transactions don't happen overnight. On the fast side, you're looking at two to three months. That's on the fast side. Uh, you know, for me personally, I'll tell you this. My recent deals, you know, we closed one on March 1st. We had that on the contract in November. So probably three and a half to four months. Uh, second one we closed early this year is late March. That one we had on the contract, you know, also four months from late November. You know, so when we closed last month, uh, we had in the contract from the beginning of December. So that was almost five months. So, so commercial transactions take time to close. They're not overnight. They don't happen easy. They don't happen fast. Uh, there's a lot less volatility than stocks because while stocks are very, very liquid, commercial real estate is as liquid an asset as you're going to find, which is good and bad. But in terms of getting data, that means it's going to take longer for data to be updated because it takes longer for things to happen. So right now, What's happening in the market is that institutional assets are generally staying in the same ballpark to where they were. They're, they're, they are experiencing some, some decrease, but not much, still fairly similar. Value-add assets, which I'm gonna go on a limb that many of us here may be looking at, are starting to come down a bit. Now, does that mean it's a buyer's market? No, it doesn't mean that at all. So don't, don't confuse what I'm saying. It just means that there's uncertainty and it means that there's a lot of buyers on the sideline and a lot of buyers who just aren't being as aggressive as they would have been three and a half, four or five months ago. So the world has changed and you need to adjust your pricing for that. That means you don't want to be fighting and, and, and trying to be the highest bidder. And in general, I never really had that problem. I've never, I've never wanted to deal on price. Uh, so I guess in that sense, that's good. But if, if that's the game that you're out there trying to compete on, now is not the time to do that. So just be careful and be aware of what's happening in the markets that you're looking at because you need to be aware of what, what the competition is out there doing. So another thing here is non-recourse debt. So for anybody not familiar with different debt types, there's, there's recourse and there's non-recourse. Both of those require a personal guarantee, but the difference is that recourse is a full personal guarantee. So that means if, if you run the asset into the ground and you get the property foreclosed on, that lender can come after you, they can take your house, they can take your cash, they can take your stocks, they can take any assets they can find that will allow them to recover whatever value they lost in that foreclosure. Non-recourse means that generally in most cases, there are certain exceptions, but in most cases, as long as you don't do anything criminally, that you're criminally liable for, you're probably okay. You know, So if you run the property poorly, they're not going to go after you. They're going to take the property and the property is the only recourse they have. Now, if you do something that's you know like fraud, then they will come after you personally and still go after your personal assets. Okay, so what does that mean? So if you're using non-recourse, which many of us here in the multifamily space are, what you're going to see is that a lot of deals are getting done right now with adjustable rate bridge loans. So bridge loans are a lot of times designed to be shorter term in nature. And depending on the size of the deal you're looking at, they're probably gonna be a two or a three year term. And a lot of times they're going to have some type of extension built in. Most common is either two six month or two one year extensions. But those extensions come at a cost and they're subject to the lender's approval. What it also means is if you're using an adjustable rate loan, it means that your rate is going to change from month to month. So Right now with the deal I was saying we're going to be closing this week, we're going to be starting at four and a half, but all of a sudden, if the SOFA rate goes up to, you know, three, three percent next month, then our interest rate is going to follow that, that, that index. So there is some risk with that. So you do have to be careful. Now, a few more things to be aware of. So if you're using an adjustable rate loan, whether it's a bridge loan or any other type of adjustable rate loan, any lender out there right now is going to require that you buy a rate cap. So for anybody not familiar with the rate cap, what the rate cap does is it gives you protection if interest rates go above so many points. And 
the, the, the exact spread is going to really vary from deal to deal because it'll be based on the lender's requirements and the loan documents. But most times it's at least 150 to 200 basis points above where you're starting. So what does that mean? It means a few things. One, that for that first 150 or 200 basis points, that's on you. So that's going to be something that unfortunately is a risk you're going to have in the deal. You know, if, if rates go up 199 basis points and your cap kicks in at 200, then that whole thing is on you. But anything above 200, then will be on the cap. So it's really more catastrophic protection than something that's going to, you know, impact in a normal situation. Nonetheless, lenders are going to require you to buy it. So what you need to do is make sure you have enough money in your capital raise for that. And I put a link in here to a, a calculator from one of the leading providers of these rate caps. Uh, you'll want to use that to budget for your rate cap. So you can go in there and play with some of the different parameters, but make sure that you put money in there because these rate caps are not cheap. Uh, depending on the size of the deal you're looking at, you know, I, I've seen some that on the low side are, you know, 150, 200,000. Now, granted, I'm looking at 100 unit deals most times. So if you're looking at small than that, maybe a little less. And I've seen others that are literally millions of dollars. So these caps can be very, very expensive. Another thing is that if you're using an adjustable rate loan, most lenders at this point are going to require a debt service reserve. So what they're going to do is they're going to take that money off the loan proceeds at closing, and they're going to keep it in an escrow account. The purpose of that reserve is if you can't pay the mortgage, which may be very possible, because if you're buying a deal and the interest rate's four and a half, and all of a sudden it becomes six and a half, uh, your mortgage payment is going to be a lot different. So they are holding that reserve to pay the mortgage and make sure they get paid. And depending on how well the deal cash flows, it's typically going to be anywhere from six to 12 months of your debt service. So in your underwriting, what you want to do is go into your, your deal one debt service and take six to 12 months and make sure you put that in there so you have enough capital. Okay, so now we're going to walk through and we'll take a peek at an actual deal. So th this is an actual deal that I underwrote recently, actually within the last week. Uh, now this one's a little bit unique because it has a loan assumption. And for anybody here who's actually attended one of my other, any of my underwriting sessions, uh, we actually initially underwrote it on there, so you may even be familiar with it. So with this here, what we're looking at is the syndicated deal analyzer, and this is the underwriting tool that I use most times. And what we have here, this is the scenarios tab. So what the scenarios tab does is it allows you to put the income and expense information in, and it gives you a starting point to build your underwriting around. So this particular tool has eight different scenarios and it lets you play with the different scenarios so you can see how different outcomes will affect the property. For me personally, the only ones I really focus on is scenario one, which is the seller's actual numbers, how they're running the property currently, and then scenario four, which is my pro forma. So those are the two that I really focus on. So if you're looking at this, scenario one here is on the left, and oops, we went too far. And scenario four is on the right. So what parameters are going to go into your underwriting? So you're going to need price. Price is always most important. You know, you can always find a deal if you find the right price. It's been tough to do that in recent years, but I think we're getting a little closer at this point, hopefully. Okay, so you'll have different tools you can play with. So in this particular case, uh, this deal is being offered, you know, for 150000 a door. If they're if they're doing a loan assumption or 160,000 a door if it's free and clear. Now that's the pricing guidance. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be where the deal winds up, but it's the broker giving you the, a, either a combination of their opinion or the seller's desired price or a little bit of both to let you know where you should be coming in. So in this case here, uh, I personally didn't want to go up to 150 a door with the loan assumption, so I came in at 144, which in today's market, I think will wind up being very competitive. Three months ago, I would have been grossly on the price. Now it's probably not so bad. Um, so we have here the number of units of the property. In this case, it's 170 unit property. We have our down payment. So in this case, with the loan assumption, does everybody here know what a loan assumption is? Okay, so for anybody who doesn't, an assumption means 
that you're taking over the existing loan of the property. So basically you're stepping into the seller's shoes. You're going to become the new guarantor on their loan and you'll wind up being the owner of the property. But instead of going out and getting your own debt, you're going to use their debt. So why would I be interested in this? Well, truthfully, it's probably a better loan than I could have got at this point. <laughs> if I was using new financing, I don't think I could have done this as well. So they have a Fannie Mae loan. And on this Fannie Mae loan, they have about seven years left. They have some interest only left on it. They have a, a fixed rate, which to me, a fixed rate is like gold at this point. And they have a fixed rate of 4.48, which I don't think I can do any better than that right now. Matter of fact, let me go on further. I'm sure I couldn't do better than that right now. So, and it's also 65% of the purchase price, which, you know, to do that on an agency loan in recent months has become a real, a real challenge. So overall, it sounds like a pretty good mix. So, so that's what, that's what interested me. And I also figured that it may give us a competitive advantage because even though some other groups wind up coming in there potentially paying more, sometimes these prepayment penalties get very expensive and they may wind up more expensive than sellers think. And they really get hit over the head with it. So sometimes they like the assumption. So that way it helps them avoid the prepayment penalty. Okay, so then as we come down a little bit, we have some other parameters we're filling in. So what you'll see is below the number of units, we have our down payment and we have our interest only. So in this case, this particular loan had 60 months of interest only. The seller's already been in it for more than two years. If we were to actually get this deal, uh, they'll probably be somewhere around 24 months left, which is why I put 24 in there. Then you'll see another line item for repairs. And the repairs up here, if you can see where the cursor is, is supposed to be our CapEx budget. So one thing I like about this property is that the seller put a ton of money into it. You know, this is a 170 unit property. It was built somewhere in the late 70s. They put about $5.3 million into it. That's a lot of money. It's like $31,000 a unit. So I felt pretty good about that. Does that mean there won't be any deferred maintenance? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Because trust me, every property has deferred maintenance. Some have more than others, but every property is gonna have some. So, you know, I felt pretty good based on the amount of money the seller put into it, that we really don't need a hefty CapEx budget, so I'm okay with that. The next thing you see below that is your operating reserve. So the operating reserve is gonna be how much money are you keeping for a rainy day? So even though the lender's keeping money, you still wanna keep your own money. You know, because what the lender's keeping is only for the loan. They're not gonna let you use that to operate the property. They're not gonna let you use that for anything that comes up. So it's good to have a reserve. We normally do four months of our operating expenses of our pro forma operating expenses. And we wanna make sure that we have ample cushion to run the deal. So as you come down a bit, you'll see the income and expense numbers. So these are all the, the numbers that the seller is using to run the property. Uh, this is how they're currently operating. They currently have effective gross income of 2,415 and expenses a little bit over 1.1 and then operating income of 1,299. In comparison, you'll notice on ours in, in scenario four, while we did run the expenses fairly similar, there's a lot more meat on the bone with the income. And because of that, we're able to have an NOI that's you know, $250,000 higher than where the starting point is. Now, one other thing about this deal. So you might remember before how one of the things I was saying is about property taxes and how they can jump a lot. So with this deal, uh, what would have happened is there could potentially be a $200,000 increase in the property taxes. So one of the things we're considering doing, and probably will do if we wind up getting this deal, is an entity sale. And it's not something that I've done on previous deals, but I'm, I'm open to it under the right circumstances. But in Alabama, if there's no change of deed, you do not legally have to report the change of ownership of the entity to the tax assessor. Some states you do, so be careful on that. Make, make sure that you understand that because you don't want to wind up with liability that you're not expecting. So what does that mean? So that means if they own the property with ABC LLC, instead of me going out there buying the property, I'm actually buying ABC LLC. And we're just having a change of officers in that entity. The downside to that is you're also taking on their liabilities. So if they have something that we're not aware of, so let's say that 
three days before closing, when they still own the property, somebody slips and falls. So there's a good chance that no legal documents are going to be served in those three days. But being that we own the property and we essentially own the entity and there was no change in ownership of the property, then we're on the hook for that, unfortunately. Now, you could always sign a hold homeless agreement or an indemnification agreement, but trying to actually find somebody and let them know, look, here's your insurance claim. It happened three days before you sold the property. It's probably an unlikely event. So, so you're realistically going to be owning that. So that, that's, the, that's the one downside to the entity sale. Okay, so then as you scroll down further, you're going to see your, your interest rate, your amortization period, and more information on your debt service. Okay, so th these are all things that are going to be important components of your underwriting. Okay, so the next slide here, this is the summary tab on the syndicated deal analyzer. So this one here really gives you the meat and potatoes of what your returns look like. This is going to give you the high level summary of what your deal is. So it's recapping the number of units and the purchase price. It's also showing us the financing details. So it's showing us a down payment just north of you know, 7.6 million. Financing in the first mortgage, approximately 16.8. And it's also showing us details about the, the NOI and different, different data that we need. The metrics that I always focus most on, to me, first is cash on, uh, cash, on cash return. And when I say first, this is going to be the order they appear not necessarily the order of importance. So cash on cash return. At this point, we have a legitimate 8%. The, the last time that I've seen a deal with the legitimate 8% cash on cash return was probably a year ago at this point. So truthfully, th this, this made me jump right away. The fact that this property's had a lot of money put into it, it's in a great area. You know, I, I said, well, this seems like a win. So 8% cash on cash return to me has become harder and harder to realize. So I think that that's great. And part of the reason you can do that is because of the assumption. Okay, so the next thing here is debt coverage ratio. So I always tell people debt coverage ratio is not going to make you money. What it will do is let you sleep at night. It's going to let you sleep because you're going to know that your mortgage is paid and that you have plenty of cash flow coming in to make sure of that. Because the, the lenders always going to look at the debt coverage ratio because they want to make sure the mortgage should be paid. You know, most lenders don't want to be property owners. Some might, the ones who are also investors, those are usually your bridge lenders. But a more traditional lender, like this particular loan for Capital One, trust me when I tell you this, Capital One has no interest in being a landlord. They want to be a lender. They want to, they want to send you a mortgage bill every month. They want to get their, their payment. So they want to make sure that the debt coverage ratio is strong. Most lenders usually require a minimum of 1.2 or 1.25, depending on the lender. Uh, in this case, you'll notice our year one debt coverage ratio is 2.05, which, you know, quite frankly, with the way things have been priced recently, that's incredible. Okay, so our average annual return. So this is the average annual return for the total life of the deal. So in this case here, we're projecting a five-year hold. So what it's doing is taking our total return, which right below it shows is 89.76%, and it's dividing it by five, which is the number of years that were in the deal to come up with the average return. And that's a combination of both cash flow and proceeds on sale. So that's gonna be both sides of the equation. And then the bottom one is the IRR. So the IRR is a metric that's often used to compare different asset classes because it's usually determined to be the most accurate. Now it's probably also the most complex. Uh, so I'm not gonna go too far into that tonight, but IRR is a metric that's going to involve the net present value. And it basically involves time value of, of money and where things are going. So because of that, it, it, it's a more complex metric than the average hour return, but also probably a more accurate one. Okay, so next, next thing we have here is the p &L tab of the syndicated deal analyzer. So this is going to show us the income and expenses drawn out over a particular period of time. So you could actually go as far as 10 years, but we only show five on here because that's what we're planning to sell this deal in if we get it. And what you'll see is the income and the expenses and the NOI, and you'll also see the cash flow. So you'll notice down here, there's a line item that says cash flow available for distribution. So this is the cash flow that's available after you pay your mortgage. So you'll notice in year one and year two, 
uh, it's consistently on the on, on the rise. It does drop in year three. So why does it drop? It drops because the interest only ends at that point. And now we're paying principal and interest while so mortgage payments actually went up. But you'll notice our cash on cash return has become further down. It's going to tell us here 7.2, 8.92, 7.52, 7.97. So every single year it's above 7%. So most of us in this room are probably looking to syndicate. If you're looking to syndicate, most investors are expecting a preferred return. It's, it's, it's certainly not a, it's not something that is a requirement. You don't have to offer one, but most indicators do. And because of that, a lot of investors expect it. So if you want to compete with people, you'll probably need to do the same thing. Otherwise, you'll, you'll have your investors going elsewhere. So the good news is we can pay a preferred return out right from day one on this. So that's fantastic. You know, I, I haven't seen any deals recently that show that. So that, that to me is a wonderful thing. You'll also notice at the very bottom, the debt coverage ratio is very high. So these are all good signs. Now, keep in mind, guys, you're going to look at a lot of deals where the numbers aren't going to be this pretty. You know, there's a lot of deals where they don't come anywhere close to this. So the key is that you just have to keep looking. You know, if you look at enough deals, eventually you're going to find something that makes sense. Um, you know, truthfully, even the good deals I've looked at probably haven't been this good. So th this one's definitely more of a unicorn than something that's happening regularly right now. Okay, so this, this tab here is the acquisition cost. So in addition to your, your down payment and any other fees that are directly related to the acquisition of the deal, these are other costs you're going to need. Now, a lot of these things are pre-filled and most times I don't usually touch them. Uh, the ones that I personally touch are down here, lender held funds, real estate taxes, insurance, and then also at the very bottom. So lender held funds, if I'm using a bridge loan, that's usually where I'm gonna put my interest reserve. So most deals that I look at, I usually figure six months. So I'm gonna take my year one debt service and just cut that in half and that'll be my, my six month reserve. In this case, with the loan assumption being it's a fixed rate loan, I don't need a debt service reserve, so that's great. But if this was an adjustable rate loan, you need to put some money in there for that, otherwise you're going to be very short at closing. Real estate taxes, for taxes and insurance, I would recommend for both that you use 12 months of those numbers and 12 months of your pro forma number, not necessarily the seller's number. So for insurance, you're going to, you know, you're going to need to pay your year one premium in full at closing. The lenders typically require that. Most times they're not going to let you finance it. And what the lenders are also going to do most times is they're going to establish an escrow for taxes and insurance. And depending on the lender, they may take anywhere from three to six months of taxes and insurance, but you want to make sure you have enough money. That's usually why I tell people to go with 12. I'd always rather you budget more than less. Make sure you have enough money. You don't want to wind up short of closing. Now, if you happen to be using the same underwriting tool, the syndicated deal analyzer, they don't actually have a spot in here for a rate cap yet. So what I've been doing lately is I put that in the travel section and I add that to it. The reason I do that is because the sections up here, lender held funds, taxes, insurance, part of these things actually get returned at the sale. And there's, there's an equation in the syndicated deal analyzer that, that allows that to happen. Unfortunately, none of the rate caps are going to get returned at sale. So you want to make sure you do not put it in any of those sections because that will impact your returns. Okay, so the next one here is the exit strategy tab. So the exit strategy is usually going to be one or two things. It's either going to be a straight sale or it might be some type of refinance followed by a sale in the future. So most times when I look at deals, I'm usually looking at it from the perspective of a straight sale. Uh, if you happen to have something that's at enough of a discount where you can do a, a cash out refi and make it work, I would say go for it. But most of the stuff I've looked at hasn't been there. So uh, the way we would look at this is going in there, assuming the existing loan, we have seven years left on the term. And the goal will be to sell at the end of year five. And right now, what I would say is that, you know, a few months ago, if you would have asked me, I would have preferred to be a much shorter hold. Uh, even though we would underwrite things for three to five years, a lot of times I was really shooting for 12 to 18 months. And a year ago or three months ago, that would have been feasible. I don't know if it's feasible anymore. Uh, the market's definitely changed. You know, conditions aren't where they were a few months ago. And because of that, it means you're probably going to have some longer hold periods. 
So we may start seeing you know, three, four, five, six year hold periods again, because you'll need to let the market rebound in order to really capitalize on the sale. So in this case here, you can choose what year you want the sale of the refinance to take place. We, we selected our sale for year five. And what it's doing is it's taking the net operating income at that time and applying a cap rate. This is called the terminal cap rate, which is the, the cap rate that's applied at sale. And it's, it's determining our sale price will be about $34 million. So in this case, we're aiming to go in there and buy it for 24.5. Uh, we're anticipating a sale around 34.1. And what it's doing is it's calculating the returns based on the combination of cash flow and sale proceeds that we'll see. And that's what it uses to come up with the IRR 15.68. Okay, so with this deal here, being there's an assumption, what happens is usually the broker or the seller is going to give you some information so you can plug those, those details into your underwriting. So all the details we have are on this sheet. So you'll notice with some of the underwriting, it matches up to the different parameters that are here. And the reason for that is because we wanted to transpose that information so it matched up. So that, that was something that was you know, important. Make sure you put that information in. Same thing with insurance. So keep in mind when you're doing the initial underwriting, you may not have this information, but as you go through it, you get it and you update it. So we have two insurance brokers that we deal with on a regular basis. And I reach out, I get an indication. So an indication is basically a soft quote. And what that means is that the insurance agent doesn't have all of the information they need to give you a formal quote, but they're going to give you a high level overview based on what they're seeing in the market for that particular property type. So in this case, one thing I like about this insurance broker is that they give you three separate indications. They give you a low, a middle, and a high based on what they're seeing. Uh, my recommendation personally is never to use a low one. I wouldn't want to underwrite for that because that could be a nasty surprise in case you can't get that. You know, there's a lot of times things, things happen at properties that you don't realize until you get in there and do a due diligence inspection. Uh, one thing we know about this property is that it did have aluminum wiring. It's, it's been remediated, at least that's what we're told. But is it possible that we can go in there during due diligence and realize, well, maybe something wasn't remediated? So that could be a possibility and that could have a drastic impact on our insurance premium. So in this case, you know, I'd actually used 102,000, which is even higher than the high number. But part of the reason I did that is because I've seen a lot of volatility in the insurance market recently. So I want to make sure that we have enough money in there. So we're not very surprised if something comes in high. So this is just some of the information you'll see as you go to follow up on things. And that there's the end of the presentation and my contact info is up there if anybody wants it. Uh, Jason and Dexter, do you guys want to open up with some questions? Yes, because I was taking so much notes, Charles. Mm -hmm. I learned so much. So uh, I was going through the chats and I saw that people have some questions for you, Charles. So, right. to, uh, if anybody wants to ask some questions, feel free to ask it. Well, I see we have a couple in the chat box. I guess we can start with Jeremy's. Uh, so, he says, What other underwriting tools am I using? And if I use other tools, why do I use one over the other? So, at this point, I personally do almost all of my underwriting with the syndicated deal analyzer. I have used other ones in the past. I think what it depends on is finding the right one that works for you. So for me, I like to be detail oriented enough to make sure that I understand what I'm doing, but not detail oriented enough that I want to spend five hours underwriting a deal. Mm -hmm. And it, it depends on what you're looking for, because you can get some that'll go really granular and they'll allow you to enter information month by month. But when you start doing that for 170 tenants, it's gonna take you some time. Um, but it, you know, if you have the desire to do that, there are tools out there that will have that and it'll probably be even more accurate. Because one thing you'll realize is you could underwrite the same deal in three or four different underwriting tools. And what you'll see is you'll get a slightly different result in every single one of them. And the reason for that is because they probably will have different data inputs and they may have different ways they're calculating things to, to give you that result. So the syndicated deal analyzer, the reason I started using that, 
Yeah, I, I've been using it for about two and a half years at this point. And when I first started, I heard a lot of good things about it. It was probably one of the more popular ones on the market. And I said for 129 bucks, it wasn't bad. Uh, you know, I think it does everything I wanted it to. And I said, okay, you know, I own other underwriting tools, one of which cost me $2,000 up front and has an annual renewal fee of 900 bucks. And, you know, the truth is I had a higher expectation for that because I paid so much more for it. I can't really say that I got a better result. Uh, but part of the reason that I keep it is just because that one's connected to a network. So I said, you know what? I keep it more for the network than the other writing tool. Uh, and I've used some other ones in the past too. But what I would say for anybody starting out, the syndicated deal analyzer will do everything you need to at a basic level. So it's an affordable tool that you can get. As you get more sophisticated and you have some deals under your belt and you start doing more, you could always upgrade to something bigger and more expensive afterward. But just keep in mind what you're starting with. You know, if your goal is to track to attract institutional type equity, you might want to use Argus. But starting out, most people aren't attracting that type of equity, so it's probably not something you need to go out there and spend thousands of dollars on to, to do so right away. Okay, so then uh, looks like we have a question from Corinne. And how many variations of your underwriting do you do before submitting an LOI? So the answer, Corinne, is it depends on how much time I have. <laughs> if, if, I, if I have a little time, it's usually two. So the first one is the initial one, just to see what things I need to follow up on. And then I update it. And by that point, I have a good enough, uh, a good enough you know, uh, version of the underwriting that I can determine, OK, I want to move forward and, and submit an offer on this deal. If I don't have much time, the answer is one. Because if it's an off-market deal or maybe something that's off-market that maybe come on market if I don't move on it fast, then I know my window is shorter. So I'm going to have to go off more assumptions and less confir confirmed information. And that also means there's more risk because that means that there's a, there's a better chance those assumptions can be wrong. But sometimes when you're looking at a deal and you have a short timeline, that may be what you have to do. Thanks, Charles. That was really helpful. Um, if I could um, just ask another, um, you know, supplemental question yeah, to that. Absolutely. I've heard that there's also some risk involved with going to the assessor because then it raises some red flags that that, that property will be purchased and the assessor will be on the lookout to reassess that property mm -hmm. and that there are actually opportunities to go to secondary parties. Uh, to, to gather information on the taxes. What's your take on that? I don't trust any secondary parties. Uh, Makes sense. I, I want to hear it right from the assessor. So, so let, let me reassure you this. I don't like giving government more information than I need to. Uh, so you, don't, you certainly don't want to raise a red flag, but make no doubt about it. If an assessor's job is to reassess and get that higher value, they're not going to miss that. The government will miss things about Point. clients, They'll miss things with oversight. They do not miss things that bring in revenue. Good point. Thanks, Charles. Yeah. You know, my thought is I reach out to them directly because I want to understand how the process works right from the horse's mouth. And I want to make sure that I have that factored in correctly. Usually, I'll try to get an email reply from them too. And most counties are usually pretty good about that because I like to have something in writing. And, and there's times I've even used it for lenders where one time a lender said, that you know, they thought what I had was wrong. And I said, oh, no, it's not. Here's the email right from the county assessor. So, so you know, when you have that, it just gives you more credibility. Uh, then I see we have another question in the chat box from uh, Jeremy about never winning a deal on price. So I joke around with a lot of the brokers I know. And I said, well, you know, if I, if I came up with the highest price, it probably means I made a mistake in my underwriting. <laughs> And, and, you know, most times when I'm winning deals, uh, earlier on, it would have been because there was less competition and we were probably just the most credible group there. And to some extent, that's kind of what it is now. You know, am I going to go out there and win a deal against an institution? Not yet. You know, eventually that's the goal, but I haven't got there yet. Uh, but if I'm competing with other groups, you know, what I'm going to win on is track record and maybe non-refundable money. Now, let me be clear, there's a lot of risk doing non-refundable money. So I, I wouldn't recommend it starting out if it's something that, you know, that's gonna put you in a really bad position financially. 
because it can. So it should just be clear on that. Um, it took me about four years looking at deals before I really felt confident submitting offers with non-refundable money. And even then, you know, I, I probably got a little queasy the first few times I sent them out. You know, I, I was even hoping maybe they wouldn't be accepted because I said, boy, this is a lot of risk. <laughs> but when you start doing it, you get used to it. And what you'll find, especially right now, as market conditions are changing, sellers are very nervous that deals aren't going to close, even more than they would have been before. Because the thing is, if their deal doesn't close now, and we go three months down the line, and interest rates go up another 100 basis points, that means the deal's worth even less. And it means there may be less buyers out there. So that's going to be a huge thing right now. They want to see that you can close. And what makes them feel more confident than close and your ability to close is one of two things. Either that you've closed deals before, preferably of similar size and in similar locations, that'll give them even more confidence, and or non-refundable money. So if you put up non-refundable money, that goes a long way to make the seller say, okay, these guys aren't going to want to lose this money. Uh, so they're going to be very motivated to make sure this deal gets completed. And if we have some more questions, I would say go for it. Uh, we don't have any more in the in the chat box, but you know, if it's okay with Jason and Dex, Dexter, I'd say go for it. Hey, Charles, this is Christian. Hey, Wait. Christian. I have to give a shout out to Christian because he helped me out and designed the PowerPoint presentation for tonight's <laughs> presentation. So, all right, thanks, Christian. Yeah, anytime, anytime, uh, y'all. But Charles, you mentioned that you know property management companies they're they're oftentimes your right hand and can help throughout the entire sort of deal prep, deal review process and so on. From what you've seen in the market, how, how like what, what are your thoughts on vertical integration? I've heard a lot of folks talking about vertical integration. I'm curious to hear what you think about it. It's a good question. It's, it's an idea I've been tossing around my head for the last few months, you know, at least. <laughs> um, so what I, so let me give opinions on both sides. So using third-party management, um, you're probably going to find a lot more bad third-party management companies than you will good ones. I, I, I say jokingly, I probably find 10 bad ones for every one good one, but there's probably truth to that. Uh, you know, I, I think of the three deals that we closed last year, I fired property management companies on two of them. <laughs> wow. And, you know, so, so why does that happen? So a lot of times companies are better on the sales than they are on the execution. And they're better on the sales because obviously you need to be because that's what brings revenue in. And it could be any number of reasons. Maybe they don't have the systems in place. Maybe they don't have the personnel. Maybe they just don't care. You know, it could be any number of reasons of why things don't go the way you may expect them to. But you'll find that there's a lot more bad management companies than good ones. And unfortunately, the downside is sometimes you don't really know until you get in a deal with them. Of course, they may say all the right things in the interview. They may do everything well, kind of leading up to it. Uh, one thing I have realized from experience is if they don't do well courting me, they probably aren't going to do well managing the property. So there's one management company I got smart with, and I fired them before we even hired them last year because I said, no, this isn't going to work. But that, that, that took a few times realizing, okay, you know what? If they're slow getting back to me now before they're actually managing the property, how are they going to be once they have my business? And I said, this isn't going to work. Yeah. Um, what I would also do is make sure that you have the ability to be involved. You know, you don't want to necessarily micromanage them, but you want to make sure that you have access to information, that you have access to personnel, and that you'll be able to be involved in the decision-making process for your asset. Now, if you go first party, so what are the pros to that? So the single biggest pro to first party is that you have more control. For me, I'm a control freak. So in one way, that kind of attracts me. But what it also means is you have more responsibility and you need more time. And for me personally, I know I don't have more time right now. <laughs> uh, so, so you can easily run into a, a situation where even if you vertically, vertically integrate, if you don't have the, the money or the systems to properly scale, you could easily run into the same issues that many of those third party management companies do. So you have to look at what the right decision for you is. 
And that's going to vary for everybody. Eventually, I might like to take management in-house. I decided against it for the immediate time because I don't really have time to go out there and build a property management company on top of this. So if I do that, that's going to take time away from me running the syndication business. And there's only so much time. Yeah. So what I would say is figure out where your time is best spent and what, re what, what result is going to be best for you and then go with that approach. If you could find good third-party management companies that you work with and they do a good job for you, I have no problem sticking with them. Now, one more thing that's worth pointing out, and, and for somebody just starting out, this probably won't be relevant, but as you get more advanced, it will be. So a lot of groups in this business, as they get more advanced, they want to become able to get larger, larger equity, myself included. So for me, one of my objectives is I want to start getting family office money. I want to start getting equity groups. I want institutional money. Uh, but to do that, some of those groups require that you're vertically integrated. So I spoke with one guy in California last week who runs a, a family office. And it was a very quick, you know, probably three minute conversation, if at that. And one of the first questions he asked was, do, do you guys manage your own properties? And as soon as I said, no, he said, well, come back to me when you do. So that was a very quick conversation. Uh, but you'll see that from a lot of those groups. And the reason he gave, and I, I can't really blame him on this, he said, people blame the management because they'll say, oh, well, it's the third party management company's fault. And he said, I don't want to hear that. He said, I want to make sure that whoever I'm investing with has that responsibility and that control. So you will see that from some of those larger groups. Awesome. Thank you, Charles. You're welcome. Hi, Charles. This is Vasi. Yes. Yeah, Good question. Um, we're seeing some easing, I guess, or cooling in terms of price expectations. Are you seeing similar cool down in the terms of the LOI as well, or are those still holding pretty steady? The, those are still holding the same, but I'd have to imagine they will cool down. At least I hope they'll cool down, I should say. Uh, I, I'm kind of hoping that non-refundable money becomes a thing of the past in the next few months. But I, I think what's going to ultimately determine that is what direction we go. So right now, it's hard to say that the market's going up or down, but just that it's kind of going sideways and uncertain. And even though pricing is coming down a bit, so on the institutional stuff, you're probably 5%, maybe 10% on the high side, but probably 5%. On some of the value rate stuff, you're as much as 20% down. So that, that is a more sizable jump. But there's still enough buyers out there where people are putting up non-refundable money and things like that. I think if we see credit dry up, uh, which I don't know that's going to happen immediately. There's still a lot of capital out there, but, but lenders are starting to get nervous. If lenders get nervous and it reduces the amount of available credit options that are out there, which may very well happen, then you'll start seeing term change because a lot more buyers will be on the sidelines. They won't want to take the risk of putting up, you know, a quarter of a million or a half a million or a million dollars saying, okay, we, we did this, we thought we had a deal and now we can't get financed and we lost a million dollars because of it. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. We have any other questions? Well, Jason and Dexter, I'll turn it back to you guys. Okay, and thank you so much, Charles. And uh, I was taking so much notes. So let's continue with our slides, okay? So, um, okay. So, thank you again, Todd, for answering all those questions. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Sorry about that. Just a reminder, quick reminder, everyone, for Wednesday, June 29th, will be our first ever live event in the city of Glendale by uh, the famous bar. We'll have Jason, personal attorney, Josh Driscoll, and he'll be speaking on corporate structure.
Okay. okay. Technical difficulties, yeah. technology, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, um, once again, you guys, as you guys can see on the screen, I have put all of our contact information, mine, Dexter's, and Charles, in case you guys want to reach out to any of us. And before I forget, Charles, um, would you like to tell everybody about your Saturday class and how they can join? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, thank you for the plug, Jason. So for anybody who's unaware, every Saturday at four o'clock Eastern, one o'clock Pacific, uh, I host a free underwriting session on Zoom where we look at a, a multifamily deal each week. And, you know, we allow the attendees to also submit deals, some of them from me, some of them from the attendees. And we walk through the underwriting each week and then we open it up for discussion to answer any questions people have. So if you want to attend that, you can either reach out to me by text or email and just let me know that you attended the MFM meetup and you want to join uh, or reach out to Dexter or Jason and they'll put you in touch with me. Thank you very much, Charles. And I just want to tell everybody that your Saturday classes has personally helped me improve my underwriting skills significantly. I'll, I'll second that. Most definitely, I got more comfortable in my underwriting of uh, larger writing larger deals from the class. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you very much, guys. Right on. I'll third that. Once again, I want to give a best, a very special thank you to Charles for spending this Wednesday evening with us, and everyone else that took the time out of their day to come get this valuable information. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, uh, um, <laughs> thank you again, Charles. Thank you again, Dex. Thank you, everybody, for for being here. And then um, we'll see you guys at the live meetup on Wednesday, June 29. Um, come and have a drink with us. And uh, we'll go learn and network.